So longtime viewers of the channel may know that I have some weird interest in equations involving the floor function. So I thought we hadn't done one in a while, so we might as well solve an equation involving the floor function. So here we're gonna solve the floor of the square root of x equals the floor of the cube root of x. So what I mean by that is find all of the real numbers x that satisfy this equation. So first I wanna recall real quick what the floor function is. And so we say the floor of u, or sometimes the greatest integer function, is the greatest integer less than or equal to u. So for some examples, the floor of pi is three, because pi is between between three and four, but it's not equal to four, 3.1415 and so on and so forth. So you, that takes you to the elevator downstairs to three. And then the floor of minus three over two is gonna be minus two. That's because minus three over two is like minus one and a half, but the floor is gonna take us down to the closest integer. That's gonna be minus two. And then finally, the floor of five is equal to five because we're already at an integer. And that's actually important to notice that if we are already at an integer then we're good to go and we can stop okay great so now let's get to it so let's see if we have the floor of the square root of x equals the floor of the cube root of x then that actually tells us that the floor of the square root of x equals n and the floor of the cube root of x equals n, where this n is the same natural number. Let's flesh out what that really means. So the floor of the square root of x being equal to n, that tells us that the square root of x is going to be bigger than or equal to n, but strictly less than n plus one. And then the floor of the cube root of x being equal to n means the same kind of statement, but with the cube root of x. So we know that the cube root of x is between n and n plus one, where n is like this natural number, or maybe this positive integer really here. Okay, so we have this condition on our number x at this point. Now, next what I wanna do is maybe square the first inequality and cube the second inequality to give us an inequality involving x. So that's gonna give us n squared is less than or equal to x, which is less than n plus one squared. And cubing the second inequality will give us n cubed is less than or equal to x, which is less than n plus one cubed. But now, since we know something about the growth of the squaring function versus the cubing function, we can actually mash this all together into one long inequality. That long inequality is gonna go like this. So some of it is not super mind blowing, but it is important to see kind of the structure here. So we have n squared, is less than or equal to n cubed, which is less than or equal to x, which is less than n plus one quantity squared, which is less than or equal to n plus one quantity cubed. So again, mashing these two inequalities together gives us this. And now what we wanna hone in on is the central inequality here. The fact that we have n cubed less than or equal to x, strictly less than n plus one squared. And if we can find n that satisfy this inequality, then we're really in a good place. So let's maybe go ahead and do that. So we're going to have this kind of sub goal, which is to find n, which are natural numbers, such that n cubed is less than n plus one squared. Then if we can find natural numbers that satisfy that, then we just look for x values that are between there, make some tests, and then we're good to go. Okay, so let's maybe see how this goes. So we can change this inequality to maybe one involving zero. That'll be something like this. We'll have n cubed minus n squared minus two n minus one is less than zero. So I just squared out the right-hand side of that and moved everything over. Okay, so now we can talk about this in terms of when a function is negative at this point. So let's maybe go ahead and define this function. So I'm gonna call it f. 
and we'll have variable t. So f of t is going to be equal to t cubed minus t squared minus 2t minus 1. Now, I'm not going to find exactly what the roots are of this function because I don't really need to know that. I'm just going to find out that this function is positive after a certain point. But then since our n value up here is either 0, 1, 2, so on and so forth, that restriction really gives us enough information along with maybe knowing that this function is positive after a certain point. Good, so maybe what I first want to notice is that if I plug 3 into this function, what do I get? So I get 3 cubed, that's 27, minus 3 squared is 9, minus 2 times 3 is 6, minus 1. So let's see what we get from that. So we've got 27 minus 6 minus 1 is 20, minus 9 is 11. So 11 is positive. So we know that 3 is not one of the numbers that makes this inequality satisfied. And I mean, we can check that by hand. Notice 3 squared is equal to, sorry, 3 cubed is equal to 27. But then uh, 3 plus 1 is 4. 4 squared is equal to 16. But 27 is not less than 16. So 3 does not work here. Now what we want to show is that this function is increasing for all t values bigger than 3. So that's the next thing that we'll show, that this thing is increasing for t bigger than or equal to 3. And we're going to do that just with the first derivative test. So in other words, we're going to take the derivative of this function, find out where that derivative is 0, and then pick a test point to the right of that place where the derivative is 0. So maybe the derivative of this just using the power rule is going to be 3t squared minus 2t minus 2. We want to set that equal to 0 to find the critical points. Notice we're probably going to want to use the quadratic formula for that. We're going to get t equals, so it'll be negative b. So let's see, that is going to be 2 plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. So b squared is 4 minus 4 times a times c. So let's see, it's going to be 4 times uh, 3, which is 12, times 2, which is 24. So we have 4 plus 24 there. Let's see, 4 plus 24 is going to be 28. And that's going to be all over 2 times 8, so that's going to be all over 6. And then um, you guys can check maybe that that can simplify pretty easily to 1 plus or minus the square root of 7 over 3. Okay, great. Now, what I want to notice next is that 3 is larger than either of those roots. And so since 3 is larger than either of those roots, we can use 3 as a test point. So let's just reiterate what's going on here. So the only place that this function can change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing is at these critical points. In other words, when the derivative equals 0. So the derivative equals 0 at 1 minus root 7 over 3 and 1 plus root 7 over 3. So the number 3 is to the right of 1 plus root 7 over 3. So if the function is increasing at the number 3, then it's increasing for all t bigger than 3. So let's go ahead and check f prime of 3 to see what's happening at 3. So that's going to give us 3 times 3 squared. So that's going to be 27 minus 6 minus 2. So let's see, 27 minus 6 is 21, minus 2 is 19. So we get that this thing is 19, which is bigger than 0. So that means it's increasing at 3. And since 3 is to the right of the last place that it can change from decreasing to increasing, then that means, yes, we have just checked that it's always increasing for t bigger than or equal to 3. But then the fact that it's increasing everywhere after t equals 3 and it's positive at t equals 3, then that tells us that f of t is bigger than or equal to 0 for t bigger than or equal to 3. Great. 
So let's see what we've got here. We've got this function, which is like a continuous version of the left-hand side of this inequality, is bigger than zero if t is bigger than or equal to three, which means this inequality does not hold if n is bigger than or equal to three. But that tells us that this is only going to hold for n equals 0, 1, or 2. If you have any n value larger than that, then you have to stop. You're not good to go. So that means we really just need to check cases here for n equals 0, 1, and 2. So let's maybe clean this up and we'll do just that. So on the last board, we used some arguments involving just basic algebra and then calculus one to show that we really wanted this inequality here where x is bigger than or equal to n cubed and less than n plus one squared. So those are the types of values of x that will make this floor equation satisfied. Then we also showed that the only possible n values here, in other words, the only possible non-negative integer values here were n equals 0, 1, or 2. And you might say, well, what about negative integers? Well, negative integers will not play into this because we've got the square root of x over here, which is always non-negative. Now, I think it's maybe an interesting companion question to answer this maybe when we had a minus sign in front here, or maybe we've got two different odd roots on either side of the equation, but I'll let you guys think about that. So now we just need to do these three cases. So case number one, or actually let's maybe say case number zero, which will be n equals zero. So if n equals zero, that tells us that x is between zero and one squared. So in other words, x is between zero and one, not including one. Good. So next, maybe we could put this into an op a half open interval. So that means x is on the half open interval, zero to one, including zero, not including one. So now maybe case number one would be n equals one, but that tells us that x is between one and then one plus one squared, but that's gonna be four. But then we can make that a half open interval as well. So that's gonna be the half open interval one to four, not including four. Then finally, we'll have our third case, case two, I'm counting like the computer scientist. So we've got n equals two. So that means we've got x is going to be bigger than or equal to two cubed, which is eight. But it's gonna be less than two plus one squared, so that's three squared, which is nine. But that tells us that x is on the half open interval eight to nine, not including nine. So in the end, we get x is on the union of these three intervals because either of the or any of these three cases is possible. So that means we've got x is in the interval from zero to four. Notice that if we union those two intervals together, we just get the interval from zero to four. So that's kind of cool. Union this interval eight to nine, where we include zero and eight, but we do not include four and nine. So I'll go ahead and clean this up, but I wanna give you guys some follow-up questions that you can maybe try that are similar to this. So looking at that problem, I think there are some obvious generalizations that are also interesting. So maybe this first one involves some that are quite simple, probably fall to the same strategies that we saw in uh, our equation. And that would be maybe the floor of negative the square root of x equals the floor of the cube root of x maybe with or without a minus sign in there. I think both of those would be interesting. Or we could look at the floor of the square root of that absolute value of x equals the floor of the cube root of the absolute value of x. So I think that one's interesting because that's gonna allow all integers instead of just like positive integers to enter the argument at that stage. And then here are some others. Maybe we could say, well, what about when is the floor of the cube root of x equal to the floor of the fourth root of x? Or more generally, when is the floor of the nth root of x equal to the floor of the m plus first root of x? 
And then super generally is, let's say we fix R and S arbitrarily, when is the floor of the Rth root of X equal to the floor of the Sth root of X? So maybe go ahead and play around with these and post what you get in the comments. And that's a good place to stop.